the night of the 11th of February, 1936, <coughs> we, we had a, a terrible storm here in Ballycotton, so we steamed out close to the lightship. While we were on passage out, the foremost of the two red lights was blown out. So I says, if the other one goes there, we will be able to find the lightship, never mind, nothing else. So we watched the chance and we came along and two of them jumped straight away, came around again and got no one the next time. So on the third occasion we got two. And the next time then we were two, there was two of the crew then, and they seemed to have a hold of the rail and wouldn't let go. So I ordered some of our own crew to go for it and to try to gas them and haul them aboard. Having successfully done that, the Ballycotton crew returned to port. The most famous rescue in Irish lifeboat history had been carried out. Six men saved from the Daunt Rock lightship adrift in mountainous seas off Cork Harbour. The lifeboat Mary Stanford had fought through sea conditions so bad that spray was flying 196 feet high. She was commanded in those dreadful conditions by Patsy Sliney, who won a gold medal for the 63-hour rescue, adding it to the other medals he'd won for valour in his career as Ballycotton coxswain. Honours also went to a six-man crew, accompanied as always by their faithful mascot. Typical lifeboat men, ordinary villagers from a small port in East Cork, men who carried out heroic deeds without thought for themselves. Silver and bronze medals were awarded to the crew for the service which still dominates Irish lifeboat history. It's never been repeated or equaled anywhere else in the service. Fifty-one years later, the Mary Stanford, which was the only lifeboat in the institution's history to be awarded a gold medal itself, returned to Ballycotton, escorted by the fast new Aaron-class boat now stationed in the port. Having served 25 years, lifeboats are withdrawn and sold outside the service. The Mary Stanford had done duty as a pilot boat on the Shannon estuary. She was brought home by Brendan Sliney, grandson of the famous coxswain. Today the tradition of the Mary Stanford is carried on by a half million pounds worth of boat, the 52 foot Aran class with a speed of 18 knots, latest of the RNLI fleet. Volunteer crews get intensive training, including helicopter liaison work. Their boats are extensively tested before going into service. Each must be capable of self-writing, so they undergo a capsize test and this is meticulously recorded. These boats will go to sea in the worst of weather, while others head for safety. They'll have to withstand appalling conditions in their efforts to save life. Older style boats were not self-writing, but all Irish lifeboats can now write themselves in the event of a capsize. Local Secretary Paddy Gallagher fires the maroon at the Valencia Island station. It's the traditional call-out for the Kerry crew, who face the wild Atlantic, a tough assignment of what can be a very bleak coastline. The secretary must make the decision to launch on a rescue mission. The islanders crew a 52-foot iron class made of glass fibre. They board by launching craft. Their lifeboat is kept out in the bay, moored there, ready for immediate use. Their main problem is often getting aboard from the beach itself. Our worst problem really is getting on board the boat from, from, from the boathouse. Uh, Sometimes there are northwest wind and, and swell. It's very hard to get out, but uh, we've never actually, uh, once we got to the boat, been unable to, to go to sea. Well, you've got to be prepared to go to sea in any conditions, and you've got to put someone else's safety before your own. Uh, not so much that you discard your own safety, but you've got to be willing to, to take a chance to, to save someone else's life. And I suppose they are basically the main qualities that, that are asked for. You've got a respect for the sea you're going to face. You, you don't sort of fear it in that sense, but you have the respect for it, so therefore you treat it with respect. And uh, if you treat it with respect and, and you understand what, what it's all about, generally speaking, of course the vessel comes into it, that uh, it's such a fine vessel, like and it's so well designed, that you're fairly confident in the vessel all the time. The very first night I was here in the parish, about two o'clock in the morning, the maroon went off and gave me quite a fright. So I, I was quite aware of what was going on at that stage. And uh, I think if you ask me about the whole service, it's in this part of the world, you know, facing the wild Atlantic. It's certainly a most invaluable service. Here you have a band of dedicated men who are on a 24-hour service. 
and uh, they often risk their lives going out uh, in the service of others. And of course the history of this service here in uh, Valencia speaks for itself. I think uh, as many as uh, 350 calls, distress calls, have been received here by the lifeboat. And in that uh, time as well, as many as 300 people's lives have been saved. So I think that speaks for itself. And in fact, you couldn't imagine life here in this region without the lifeboat service. What's the reward for a lifeboat man when he carries out a service? Uh, at the last stage, it was three pounds an hour, and that's only a token. It has been a token since the institution was founded. But I can tell you, if you went up the Blasket Sound in a gale of wind, and a December day, and hail showers and seas coming down on you, it isn't in the power of money to pay them. It's not for the money. You know, it, it was one of the ideals of the founder that a token would be paid. And uh, there are very few people who will do anything for three pounds an hour in this day and age. The moral reward is when somebody steps alive up the pier, where otherwise they would be lending a body or searching for a body. That makes it all worthwhile. But there's also the tragedy of loss for the lifeboat service, as in Kilmore Quay on Christmas Eve 1977, when Finbar Sinnott drowned in a capsize. The cold and fierce weather had been a false alarm. And off Dunleary on Christmas Eve 1896, the crew of 15 were lost. A cargo sailing ship was in trouble when that crew scrambled. The weather was bad when, on the eve of Christmas, the crew put out in their rowing lifeboat. They never came back alive. The stone to their memory overlooks where the crew died, and the Dunleary lifeboat stands protective guardian on the Irish Sea, with its own control station provided by locally raised money ever ready to respond to emergency. The station also operates an inshore boat from the same boathouse where those 15 men headed off in 1896. Disaster doesn't stop the lifeboat service. It's a tradition in families, a vocation of the sea. No matter how bad the weather, the service responds, and every one of them volunteers all. Lifeboat people to me are people with great vocation. I mean, it is a vocation. There's no way. I, I don't think that uh, it's something that you acquire. I think that you are born with this vocation. I mean, for somebody to go out on a bad night uh, on a call, to somebody that they don't even know who they are or what they are. They, they, you know, I think it's a magnificent service. I don't think there's anything more charitable than the lifeboat service. The lifeboat service is not a charity as such. It's a service. But I don't think there's any greater charity than one person can give another, than one goes out to see, to save another person's life. Well, you always think of the fellows at sea. He has uh, no one, only the lifeboat, to call upon. And we're there to do the best we can for that person. Well, there are times you're worried. There's no uh, use in saying that you're not worried. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I don't think there's a lifeboat person alive that could say that they weren't frightened at one time or another. I have, and I'm not ashamed to say it. But uh, you overcome that uh, your fear. And you think about the person that you're going to rescue, because he's in a far worse position than what you are. Well, to a lifeboat person, the tragedy um, is an awful experience. In fact, uh, we had it in our own family when my son was lost. That was the, the worst service that ever I had to do. And uh, the crew were just magnificent. They, they looked after me and, uh, over that period. But uh, having said that, uh, we were back to see the next morning and we have to do our job. Dunmore East, County Waterford. Frances Glody goes to work at the local pilot station. She's also the first woman ever to become a full member of a lifeboat crew. There was a bit of hassle with Poole, the headquarters of the RNLI, and they thought a woman wasn't suitable. But I heard since I was a pathologist 
that put my case forward and said that he couldn't see any reason why I shouldn't be. So, Have you enjoyed being a member of the crew then? I have indeed. For all the, the sad for all the sad cases and lonely things that have happened, it's still a, a great life. It's great for the odd time that you do, something good does happen. My first time at sea in bad weather, I really didn't know what I was heading into. And I honestly it felt like hitting against a stone wall, this boat pounding into the water. But then you get used to that. And the crew, the crew of the Dunmore East Lifeboat are a great lot of lads. And even though you know you're going to something important, somebody drowning or dying or injured, hurt, there's always, for our own sakes, we make, we have a wee bit of a giggle and a laugh, just to break that awful stillness. Even though you know we don't make little of the situation, but we do enjoy it. To keep up our own morale, we do it. Would you ever change things now and not be a member of the lifeboat crew? No, never. Never. Even for the awful things we've had to do, taking bodies of kids or whatever, never. Never. I'd always love it. Well, I think we are there uh, to do what uh, we uh, deem is necessary. Somebody gets into trouble, we are there, and I muster the crew. We get out and we say, well, there, some poor soul is out there and he's got into trouble and we are there, we are the bodies responsible for trying to get him in out of it, you know. And this is what happens really and truly, you know. We get a call and, as I say, we pick a few of the lads. It's maybe only just an ordinary call, somebody broke down over a fine day, but whether it's fine or bad, black or white or whatever creed, it doesn't make any difference to us really, you know. Uh, as I say, we go out and we bring them in. They've been doing that since 1824, in all sorts of weather and many types of boat, launched on carriage wheels off beaches and then rowed out to the rescue. Tough, dangerous work and always done by volunteers. The oarsmen gave way later to the age of sail and in their turn the sailing lifeboats were replaced by motor power. Modern vessels launched as local conditions dictated sometimes down slips into the dark of night to answer the call for help. Or, as in Clower Head in County Louth, launched and recovered across the beach, with the entire village out to help. Now there's also the fast inshore inflatable to help leisure craft and swimmers, but the trusty boats must still batter through fierce stomach churning conditions when rescue is needed. It's not an easy life. The sea provides the lifeblood of an island nation. Cargo ships daily enter our ports with the goods we need. And as well as those ships, ferries move people and motor traffic, all need the security of rescue at sea. And so do fishermen, working in all types of weather. This trawler, sinking when the lifeboat came on her, went down so fast after she capsized that her crew hadn't time to launch a life raft or don life jackets. They were lucky a lifeboat was on hand to pick them up when they jumped into the sea. Fishermen know the value of the lifeboat service. Many of them are crew members. It's a code of the sea. When there's a rescue to be done, the lifeboat responds. Ross Lair on the southeast coast, a busy port. The local lifeboat responds to an emergency call. A foreign trawler is in trouble. The crew assemble quickly. Each boat and each port always has more than enough volunteers available. There's at least a double crew always on call. It's late evening as the Rosslair boat clears port. She's heading for the casualty area. The crew don't know what they'll find when they get there or how serious the emergency may be, but they respond immediately. after a breast radio picked up a garbled distress message at 6.30 this morning, saying that Ness had fouled the propeller of the French Cité d'Alès, and it was in trouble six miles from Tusco Rock. But the message didn't say in which direction. Despite force-eight winds and low visibility, Air Corps helicopters and an aircraft with naval vessels, merchant shipping, the Rossler lifeboat and RAF support scarred a wide area off the Tusco Rock until darkness fell when the search was scaled down. So far, only that one body and some life belts have been found. 
and all day searchers clung to the slim hope that the other nine crewmen might just have managed to launch an inflatable life raft and get away. Buddy Miller is secretary of Rothler Lifeboat. It's more than 12 hours now since that distress message went out, so how confident would you be as a seaman that these men might still be surviving? Uh, if they got into a, an inflatable life raft, they have a very good chance. Uh, if they were only in life jackets or in uh, life rings, uh, I wouldn't give any, much for their chances at all. But if they're in the life raft, they have a very good chance. But the thing is to find them. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Now, it's literally as hard as that at the moment. On the 27th of November, the year 1954, Na a storm it struck the Irish coast and a mighty seas did roar. An SOS flashed to us, lair sang our ships broken in two and was answered by the coxswain of the Rossler lifeboat crew. She was a 20,000 ton tanker, you know, and uh, the weather was bad enough to break her off in two, you know, two halves. And um, one half of her, the men on were rescued by a Welsh lifeboat. And we took the remaining seven off the forward half, the other half. Well, we had six of them off right quick, you know. And, uh, the, you know what a dummy run is the first time. I said, yeah, we have a sorted out one last time. We had six of them in or maybe in ten minutes, you know. Mm. This last fella, this captain, we were a bit difficulty getting him in. He'd go in the ladder and he wouldn't turn around, you see. So my brother of mine grabs him by the leg and put him out of the ladder. And that ended there. But not every rescue has a happy ending. Sometimes a captain may not make the right decision when he decides to abandon ship. The case of the Oran Moor in 1970. After some time, the, the, the skipper of the Oran Moor decided he would abandon ship. And he requested us to come alongside to get the crew off. And unfortunately, we lost one man in the, in the process because uh, as you go in, he he dropped from the ladder, and uh, there was a danger of getting squashed between the ship and and the, and, uh, the lifeboat. You know, and that was our worry at the time. But luckily, we got him back clear of the lifeboat and got him in off the stern and on the side deck. And uh, he he was he had uh, he looked lifeless, and we we applied artificial respiration, mouth to mouth, and there was no response. You know, he was an extremely heavy man, 18 stone weight, I think, and uh, whether he. He uh, he was definitely at the water or not. He looked, you know, appeared to me as if he was. You know. But the irony of the whole thing is this: that uh, we we landed the, the survivors, ten to eleven, in Kappa, and the Armour stayed where she was, at anchor. For uh, a few days afterwards, before she eventually broke loose and went into to Strand, you know. So we often thought about. It's so difficult to, to know when to abandon ship and when not to abandon ship. The same point is still discussed over the fastest yacht race of 1979, which started from Cowes in the Isle of Wight on a 605 mile journey. Sailing on a dreamboat, wild goose, what's her name? Thinking of the spot race, the way to reach our fame. All of us were yachtsmen, experienced in deep, familiar to the ocean, but not to Neptune's greed, oh no, not to Neptune's greed. On the way out that night, the weather was very bad. We were steaming for about five or six hours, and then um, we were steaming into the weather all the time. For most of the time, we were actually covered with water completely. Um, and then in between the swells, the, you'd often find the lifeboat even in the air when the swell would go from underneath her. Um, it was as bad as I was out in, really. Um, when we started the search, then we were about 40 miles out from here. The conditions started to improve gradually then. Um, we were involved with three yachts, and uh, the one we eventually towed in was the Cassie Tate. She had 10 people on board, 
and we were throwing him back for 12 hours. The driving was fantastic because they had very high seas and I remember one particular incident where I was up in the bow throwing out the tow line and the lifeboat came down off a wave and coming down and it was the first time in my sort of experience where I unclipped my safety harness with the idea that I may have to jump on the lifeboat. But she basically reversed completely backwards up the, up the wave. And this is the coxswain's maneuverability with running the engines. We left the cows in the Isle of Wight, it being our third year. Will we ever forget the storm we met? Which introduced us to fear The lifeboats and their crewmen We never can repay Their reckless fight That August night When Neptune got his way and The old type of lifeboat, there were only small boats And uh, they were, um, it was always a hazardous job Because uh, they weren't self-fighting or anything in those days Also, um, to be a good life footman, he must be dedicated to the service. He must be willing to go out at, doesn't matter what trouble, to himself, any time he's required. I think that is the greatest thing. The physical qualities, a man must be fit. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And uh, nowadays, uh, the standards for life boats are the same as the Navy. You must pass the phys physical fitness test and the eyesight must be perfect. Otherwise, the people will not be accepted nowadays for lifeboat service if they haven't all these requirements. So nowadays, you can get any type of person aboard a lifeboat. It could be, it might be a solicitor or a policeman or a doctor or anything. But still, the requirements are the same. He must be a good seaman and he must be physically fit. And he must have the right attitude to the service. These are the, the mental attitude to the service that's what really counts. So I think that's, uh, that's what it really means. Um, life boat man, he must be 18 years of age and uh, he must retire at 55. Uh, he must be a type of person who does not lose his head when he's in a tight corner. When the conditions are bad, he must be able to Hello, remain calm and um, work out the problems, whatever they are for himself. Everything depends on the cocks in that sea. He is in complete control of the boat and all decisions are his decisions and his decisions only. And if he hasn't the confidence of the crew, he cannot really be a good coxswain. Unfortunately, lifeboats have been lost and crews have been lost because the coxswains, um, they just kept going even though the conditions were not suitable for the boats doing the job they were supposed to do. The conditions were too severe. These boats go to sea when everything else comes in over the bad weather and some misfortunate fella can't come in or he overstays his time, then these lads go into, row, into, into business and um, that is the reason why it's up to the Yarn and I and, and me on behalf of the Yarn and I to make sure that it's kept in perfect condition. When you come to survey a boat then, what are you particularly looking for from the wear and tear they've suffered? Well, after the boat is at sea for 12 months, there's bound to be um, a wee bit of damage, breakage, or, um, you know, they could look for, you must look for decay. Naturally, you look for decay all the time, because that's very serious. So, it, well, you, in other words, you keep your eyes open for everything that should lead to bad, it could lead to mistakes. When emergencies happen, there's no room for mistakes, but unscrupulous ship owners don't care about the demands they make on the rescue services. One service off the Kish Bank is recalled by John de Corsi Ireland of Dunleary. And there was a poor man lying on the deck, looking as though he was dead. And the captain said to me, would you get your doctor please to give him an injection? Because I must catch the tide at Greenock tomorrow morning and I'm already late. So I said to the doctor and he said, listen, if we don't get that fellow ashore within the next half hour, I wouldn't answer by his survival. So I had to tell the, the captain that and he cursed, but in the end he said, well, I suppose you'll have to be quick about it. And it was quite a business, but for having the crew that we have, and it's much the same crew still, 
It would have been a very tricky thing indeed, getting that fellow down off this huge ship, down into the lifeboat with her bobbing around in Force 7. However, we did, and I thought on the way back that he'd gone. But we'd uh, notified the boathouse, we had uh, the ex second coxswain in charge there, and he had an ambulance taken to St. Michael's Hospital, Dunleary. And he was for days and days in intensive care. He was Spanish, and eventually they got him round. I have never heard from that day to this, from the owner of the ship, or owners, or from the master of the ship, how is the second engineer? We're dealing with these anonymous ship owners, who are very hard to, to find where they actually live, Kowloon Bridge type. Thank you.